You know, if you read the Bible long enough and then you start to study biblical studies and then you start to study church history, eventually you come around to this, uh, under, this sort of understanding, undercurrent, that um, Mark wrote down Peter's experiences. Probably from him telling him. Like, Peter probably, literally with his own voice, told Mark these things and Mark wrote them down. And, and the book of Mark is like Jesus rock star. I mean, it's just immediate, everything is one after another after another. Um, and right smack in the middle of Mark, Jesus spits in a guy's face and his eyes become open. I mean, that's the type of book that this is, right? His, eye, his eyes become open. As we read it, sort of the point, the center point, is that our eyes would become open. I don't know about the spitting in the face part, though. There are other examples, there are other stories, are there other um, calming the storm stories in the Bible, in the Gospels? And you've probably heard that phrase, O ye of little faith. As any, I mean, that kind of is a, a church Christian uh, phrase. Oh, ye of little faith. And each gospel says it a little bit differently. But I want to reinterpret or re-understand what oh ye of little faith means coming from Jesus on that boat. Because I think the majority of us hear it and hear something that says you are not where you need to be. All right? I think that's how we, I think in my experience, the majority of folks hear that phrase coming from Jesus and think, I, I'm not enough. And I don't actually think that that's what the passage is about. So would you pretend with me like we are going to be little, um, well, voyeurs is not the right word, but like we're going to be, uh, shouldn't have said that. Um, we're looking in on the boat. This is a Rembrandt painting, and we'll, we'll look at it a little bit later. So in verse 35 of chapter 4, let's look. That day when evening came, he said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along, just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat, so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. So it's, a, it's an evening after a lot of ministry, after a lot of work, after a lot of preaching. Uh, maybe his voice is, is going hoarse from all day talking and all day projecting to a crowd without a microphone. And we know what the boats look like. Um, archaeologists have uncovered boats from around there, and a common one is about 26 feet long and only eight feet wide. So there are 13 guys on a 26 by eight boat, and normally they would be fishing um, when, there, when there was no wind. Right? And nighttime was a good time to have no wind. There was typically not wind. Wind came up from the south in the morning, and the heat and the dust and the wind blows, and then it dies down in the evening, and then you can get out there and, and get to work. So Jesus, unexpectedly, unannounced, at, says, let's go to the other side. Not let's just go on a boat. Let's cross and go to the other side. So. He's uh, asleep on this leather cushion. 
this, uh, this, I'm going to tell you the, the technical word. Um, it's a boat term. It's coxswain. Have you heard of that before? Okay. So this is, if we were, if we were doing a rowboat, I mean a, um, a competitive uh, oar boat, like a regatta or something, that would be the person who is calling out uh, go or, or stroke, stroke or whatever their, the key word is. They're sitting in the place that's either at the back or the front of the boat. This, this one happens to be in the, in, the, in the back of the boat where the rudder is. Okay, so he's not fishing, he's not rowing, he's in the place of, the, of steering, he was literally sleeping in what we can call the captain's chair, and the disciples ask, do you not care that we are perishing? This has a pattern. Remember how we talk, how we talk about the Old Testament? Every page has Jesus on it, right? Once you learn to pick up the types and the patterns and the foreshadowing, the, the Hebrew Bible, I mean, Jesus is on every page. Like, this sounds a little bit like Jonah. Like, uh, there was a great wind in Jonah. The sailors were terrified. The, the main character, Jonah, or, or Jesus, are asleep in the boat. Jonah has to throw himself overboard or convince others to throw himself, throw him overboard, uh, making that sacrifice in order that others, you know, may be well or may, or may have peace. And then that whole three days in the belly of a fish, right? Three days in the grave. I mean, there are just too many parallels. And so when we have the lens of Christ, we can look back on the Hebrew Bible and, and really appreciate what it is. But then all of a sudden, you just start seeing Jesus foreshadowed everywhere, on every page. So if you were in the boat or the, with them, and Jesus, or maybe your boss, maybe the foreman of the factory, you are working and rowing because he asked you to in the middle of the night, not not just off the shore, but to cross. And he takes nothing just as he is, right? That little phrase right there. He doesn't take any preparations with him. He doesn't have anything to go. He doesn't have food. He doesn't have water. He doesn't have the, the fishing clothing or the sailing, the rowing clothing, right? He doesn't have anything with him. Like these are experienced fishermen, and this guy is in charge of them, tells them what we're going to do, and they start doing it. And... He's not even prepared, and they didn't know it was going to happen. It was unexpected. Um, so now, after a long, hot day, now they're rowing in the black night across the sea. And the guy who's supposed to be at the rudder is sleeping, who also happens to be your boss. How would you feel? Anybody? Not real safe. Not real safe? Yeah. Anybody else? Huh? Yeah. I'd be mad too. Yep. And I think that those types of responses, we, we look to our leaders or we look to Jesus and when we see him not doing what we want, we start to think that he's not in charge. Like when he doesn't show how we want him to show, when he doesn't move how we want him to move, like I think this is all intentional. I think he, he set the whole thing up. I think this is a, like a training session. Um, he put them in this situation so that they could come out of this situation different people. Like, I'd be mad that the guy who's, who's uh, supposed to be leading is asleep while he's making us row through the night, and he's not even taking it seriously. Sometimes there was just a cushion 
that was attached to that bench. Um, sometimes the cushion came off and on, just like if we have a boat, we put a cushion on it and take it off. Um, and he was resting his head on it. And he's sleeping through the storm. Now, the storms there, they're one thing to handle during the day. Um, they're a different thing to handle during the night. This is the type of thing that uh, stories around the Sea of Capernaum would have, would have uh, trickled out of, of all the people who died um, in situations like that. You know, your great uncle or um, uh, your, your brother or your, your great grandfather, right? I mean, fishing communities, they keep, they keep a list, right? They know who they lost. And this is the experience where they lost them. And so now they're in the middle of it, and Jesus isn't doing a thing. I think the guys were livid. I, I think they were angry. I think they were cussing like sailors. I considered cussing through the whole sermon, just to sort of like <laughs> intone it, right? Chose not to, obviously. <laughs> they are so frustrated and so scared because things have just gotten out of control. And the person that that is supposed to be in control, they say, What? You you are gonna let us die? Like wh where where are you? You're gonna let us die? And and uh that type of question, um, when we ask Jesus that, our Jesus is okay with applying a little pressure to our lives. He is. The Jesus that we love and serve, he's okay you living with some tension. He's all right with that. And so when he says, you know, what about the faith? Where's the faith? I think he's saying it like, come on guys. Like, here's, here's your opportunity. Let's, and, and, and after this, we're going, we're going to be different. After that situation, we're going to be different. And so the tension and the pressure, I mean, I don't know if you have a relationship like that with Jesus, um, but I give him rude comments often, right? Like, do something a little bit differently. Like, that's the, relate, that, that's the tension that we live with, or I live with, my, my relationship with him, with God. Uh, I, I have a tension. Um, and sometimes God applies pressure to me. And not that he's like forcing his hand, but the circumstances come together and he's just okay with it. For us to live with a little pressure and a little tension. On the other side, we become different people. So let's look at the painting for a minute. I couldn't really expand it because then it, it would be out of perspective. So this is a European interpretation with a... Um, European boat, but it's a famous painting, and uh, I, I like the thing that I that impacts me the most is that from the left it's clear. From the the left there is so much light shining on this situation. Underneath, it's almost like the waves are sort of cradling the boat. <clears throat> they think that they are in certain depth. And yet I think that Jesus engineered this whole situation for spiritual formation. And I just wonder what it would be like if we had a relationship with him 
that we understand the things that we're going through lead to spiritual formation. That isn't the meek Jesus that we sing about at Christmas time. Right? That, that's not the, the Jesus who never cried, right? Isn't there a song at Christmas time where um, it says that, that Jesus was asleep and never crying? Anybody? Away in a manger. Is it away in a manger? Yeah. Okay, Jesus, Jesus cried like a, like a baby. Um, I don't know what meekness meant in that song, but our relationship with him, he's not, he's gentle, you know? But he's real, and he's authentic. I like that it looks like there's a spotlight on the ship, as if everything is known. I relate to Jesus that way. I relate to him as if everything is known, and why is he cutting me out? <laughs> Why is he keeping me from understanding? Why is he, like, why won't he let me into the in crowd, right? Um, what's he got going on there that, uh, that he can't say yet or can't do yet? I mean, when, when does this all get fixed sort of thing? Why does this bad thing happen? Like, we have those questions in our hearts. But um, in the boat... It's the feeling of death. And the feeling of death, Jesus is still right there with him. I, I cannot, oh, let me say it this way. I want to highlight that the purpose of these types of events is what they result in. Like, really, I, you know, I can't, we can't say that trouble in the world or trouble in our lives is caused by God. In fact, I would sort of just give up on trying to find the origins of trouble. I mean, when we're in situations like this, our first thing that we want to do is look for someone to blame. And usually it's the person close, sitting closest next to us, right? Usually the people we love the most, we blame them for not or for this um, we want to look for someone to scapegoat do you know what I mean by scapegoat someone who will relieve the tension of the moment someone that we can put our fear of being out of control on we're out of control we want someone that can I'm afraid of that I have anxieties um, about everything that's going on I have anxieties about something in the house or something at work or something in my personal life. I have anxieties about money. I have anxieties about whatever it is you're anxious about. And we want to, we want to find the person who we can put all of that anger, grief, sadness, confusion, frustration, because the situation has to break or you're going to break. Right? And so Jesus, he allows himself in the boat to be the guy that they start cussing out. Pretty similar to another time when the tension had to be broken and there had to be a scapegoat so that we could resolve, so that we can conclude on the cross, right? Right? There was no way for it to go on. And everything was going to explode. And yet he took that explosion upon himself. He's a scapegoat. And so I think that teaches us something about blame. God is the superintendent and Jesus is our factory foreman. Focus on the results. You will get lost in hunting uh, for who or what was wrong. I spent a lot of time like that. Um, I'm better at it now. But I was always hunting 
for the person who was wrong or the thing that was wrong. Because I believed that if I could go back and fix that, or if I could find that thing and fix it, then it would alleviate all of the, the tension and the pressure that um, I'm feeling. But the real story is, is that when you appropriately, in the right situations, let go of those things, then instead of blowing up, you actually form differently, right? Instead of the tension and the anxieties and you becoming the scapegoat of the situation, blowing up and you know going on tear, uh, a mess, instead of that, the tension and the anxiety is relieved because in your person, you've changed a bit. You have just formed differently. We talk a lot about spiritual formation at Avondale. We say, in order to know God, you have to know yourself. And in order to know yourself, you have to know God. We aren't a people who just come for a, a church service, and we used to shake hands, or we used to give hugs. Um, we aren't a people who just comes and, and does this religious experience and then goes home. And the expectations around here are that we would put ourselves in ministry um, uh, positions, take some risk, put ourselves in situations, um, or allow the Lord to show us the situation we're already in, so that on the other side of it, we're actually different. Like I, I love this community because everyone is for me. Like change occurs. I wouldn't want to. I don't want to be a part of something where it's not moving, where there's no change. Right? It's sort of a push and pull. Right? I don't want any change in my life, and yet I couldn't live in a community if we weren't changing if we weren't growing, if we weren't learning, if we weren't experimenting, if we weren't taking risks. Like, and I, you know, like the trees, right? Like trees, they, um, they grow their entire lives. When a tree stops growing, you see the, the big trees, they're actually still growing. Uh, remember when we would walk by as kids at some place and we'd see and count the rings of an old oak tree or chestnut tree um, they continue to grow their whole lives if they're not growing it's because they're dead <laughs> that's the kind of thing that Jesus puts together in the boat let's continue to live So it's interesting that, that, I mean, this speaks to me in a, in a way, too. Um, the, the pastoring thing, um, you know, there's a little trick to it. You kind of got to get the knack uh, of pastoring. I've been in situations where, say, um, I actually was taking a nap because I was so exhausted. I was taking a nap on the couch in the office. Um, and I, I missed a Thursday night because I slept like three and a half hours. It was all done by the time I woke up. Um, and uh, the other folks, I guess they came in and checked where I was and they just let me sleep. But everything went well. Everything was great. Or um, sometimes people think if you are resting that you, you're not working. Sometimes people think if you're resting, uh, you're, you're not being the leader that, that you should be. Or something like not getting to the hospital as soon as someone thought, you know, that I should be there. But it isn't really, in that situation, just like this situation, isn't really about me coming to the hospital at a certain time, early, late, whatever. That situation is really about the anxieties and the loss of control when your loved one is lying in a hospital bed. I show up and take the tension, right? 
I, I burst open the bubble. And we're close, and so people scapegoat. It's, it's just what ministry is about. It's just what ministry is about. Now, hospital ministry is one of, actually, is one of my favorites. I love it. In, in the hospital, we talk about stuff that most people never let out until those moments. Um, that is where I want to be. The outbursts that people keep inside until it's too great, the loss of control and the anxiety is too great that they have to spill. And those are critical and transitional moments. They're crisis moments. And if we handle those well, we form differently. We become more like Jesus. We become more like God. So back to the spiritual formation. When Jesus says, do you still not have faith? It, it is a harsh thing, right? But they're in the midst of an argument. They're, they're in the midst, the, the disciples are um, livid. He's, lo he's, he's uh, lost his position. Um, he's not taking charge. He's the one who's responsible for getting us out here. He's sleeping. He didn't even pr bring any food or water to get across, right? It's just, it's nighttime, blah, 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 blah. But I think if we re-understand that passage, it's not a put down. I don't think that's a put down. I don't think he's saying, here's a standard, you need to meet it. I don't think he's saying, here, feel bad about this. I think he's saying, like our moms or dads sometimes would, trust the process. Like, feel a little afraid. Um, what we're doing is we're gaining faith. What we're doing is transforming from unbelief to belief. You know, belief and faith are the same word um, in the Bible. We're transforming from not believing to believing. Critical, critical events in our lives are opportunities for God to show up so that we can grow up. But I hate saying even that. I hate that saying that phrase because I treat him the same, I treat Jesus the same way people treat me if I don't do what they thought I should do to calm their anxieties and take away the burden of not being in control. I treat him the same way. I scapegoat him all the time. And so why wouldn't I expect, if you have a relationship like that, why wouldn't I expect him to say, come on, man, Josh, you got, you got faith or what? Do you believe I'm going to do what I said I will do. That's about as simple a formula you can make about belief or not believing. Do you believe that I will do what I said I will do? And doesn't it look like, I mean, sometimes it looks like Jesus is asleep at the helm. I don't know if you ever feel that way. Sometimes it feels like the situation has no preparation for it, and now I'm in it. Right? Sometimes somebody is uh, taking me across the, uh, the, the dark sea at night. Someone who said they loved me. And I can't tell you the origin of these critical events. Sometimes the Bible says trials and tribulations. I, I, I don't think that we should get caught up in that because I don't think it's helpful. The, the, make, the backstop to the crisis, to the troubled world, is that God allow, like he allows those, this world to exist and he doesn't let us know um, where the trouble comes from. 
Like there is a gap. Like Job is the perfect example of this. There's a gap. With, like you can't get behind. You know how you can think about behind something and the behind that and the behind that and the behind that. We call that regression or infinite regression. But we get to a point where all we can say is, I wanted to know what the heck is going on. And God responds with, well, I will just be with you by your side. That's it. So we said, what is happening? Why aren't you scapegoating all this? And he says, in response, but he skips over that part. I wouldn't have <laughs> if I were him. He skips over that part. And he just says, I will be with you even to the death. Like, that's as good as we can get. That's, that's as good as I can get. I mean, that's the best I, I have to say about troubles and critical situations. But our result is the thing that we focus on. I can tell you that critical events lead to maturity. For an integrated, well-lived life, a whole life that impacts your community because you believe God will do what he said he will do. When you start believing that, all of a sudden you've got gifts and talents to share with the community and the community needs them, right? As we grow and form through difficult situations, the rest of the community needs us to share our maturity and our growth with them. Like I need that from you, you need that from me. Becoming a disciple who follows Jesus with the spirit who has sealed us to the very death in any kind of storm. And so we end on emotionally healthy spirituality. 